So we were engaged in a time of prayer, and God revealed something to me about myself. He revealed to me that I had made my life about me. I had made my life about self-promotion and self-satisfaction. And, and the, I, I tend to be an imaginative kind of guy when I'm thinking about and processing deep things. I usually do so by imagining images and symbols and metaphors. And so the image that God put in my imagination was this. I saw in my imagination this huge temple with massive columns and high ceilings and a marble floor, and there square in the middle of that temple was a statue, an idol, of myself. I had essentially constructed a temple to myself in my heart. And I was shamed by what God was showing me about myself. I was shamed to the point of tears. And I, I was even more ashamed as I, I thought about how this attitude had impacted my relationships, my relationships with my children, my relationship with my wife, my ministry. And I was in absolute tears out of the shame of this realization. But in the midst of that shame, in the midst of that tears, hope emerged. And, and emerged is, is too tame of a word, I think. Hope burst through that shame, burst through that, that, that despair. God broke into my heart. And the image that appeared in my imagination was that that temple in my heart was shaken to its foundations. The ceiling collapsed, letting the sunlight in. Out from the ground, underneath that idol of myself, these roots burst out, wrapped themselves around that statue, and squeezed it to power. The walls fell down, the floor crumbled, and all that was left was a garden with beautiful grass and flowers and young fruit trees. And there in the middle, where that statue of myself had been, those roots had twisted themselves into a cross that looked much like this one, except it was 50 or 60 feet tall. It was a beautiful garden with nothing man-made left in it. So what did all of those images, those imaginative images, mean to me? It meant that God had burst into my heart and reclaimed what was His. He shone His light into my heart and chased away the darkness that I had allowed to take root there. Because it is in the human heart that the battle between good and evil, between light and dark, takes place. We started a new series last week called From Darkness into Light. And we were talking about a war that is taking place behind the scenes in our world. It's an unseen war behind all other wars, the conflict behind all other conflicts. It is the source of all conflicts that we see. But the place that this war is fought, the battlefield, the ground that is fought over, is the human heart. The darkness represents evil. It represents spiritual corruption. It's usually associated with Satan. And to be sure, that, that um, hostile spirit we call Satan is the one who introduced the darkness into our world. But the thing is, the darkness spread beyond him. Human beings were the ones who opened the door. Human beings were the ones who caught the darkness like a disease and spread it. Darkness is a lot bigger than one hostile spirit. But the ways of darkness are violence, coercion, power, selfishness, greed, aggression. Those are the ways of darkness. But the ways of light are the life-giving ways of God. The light is what Jesus himself embodied when he came to earth. The light is God's power to bring forth life and empower that life to fulfill its God-given purpose. And the weapons of the light are not the same as the weapons of the darkness. The weapons of the light are love, compassion, gentleness, wisdom. And as we establish 
published last week, whenever the light resorts to the waves of darkness, darkness wins. It might mean one step forward for the light and two steps backward for the light. Because any time the light resorts to the waves of darkness, it will be a short-term gain for the light, but it sows the seed for later victories for the darkness. That's what we talked about last week. And if you missed that message last week, check it out on YouTube. But when Jesus came into this world, he was in every sense the goodness of God, the light of God, breaking into this world that had been reigned over by darkness in order to liberate the world. Let's take a look at the first chapter of John and take a look at how this liberation takes place. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world, that is, in the person of Jesus Christ. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. So when Jesus came into the world, when the light came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ, everyone was given the opportunity to become children of God, to embrace the light, to become children of the light, and be freed from the power, the slavery to the darkness. That is what the liberation that Jesus brought looks like. Even Jesus himself talked about it later in the Gospel of John when he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Those who commit themselves to following Jesus become the children of light. They are free from the power of darkness and they become the children of light. Now, all of us start over here. The darkness gets its hooks in us at a very early age. In fact, many believe that the darkness gets its hooks in us at birth, maybe even at conception. That's certainly what King David seems to have believed. When we take a look at what he wrote in the 51st Psalm, he writes, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, granted, the Psalms are poetry. He may have been exaggerating, but the fact remains, whether it's at birth, conception, or just early on in childhood, the darkness gets its hooks in us at a very early age. And the darkness wants to keep us over here, or better yet, drive us further into the darkness. But thankfully, God is at work over here, too, trying to bring us closer to the light. That's something we call provenient grace. It's God's love at work in our lives before we ever come to know Him. And as we respond to His grace in our lives, we're drawn closer to the light. But as we give in to temptation, as we give in to corruption and evil, we're taken further and further into the darkness. Let me give you some concrete examples of what this looks like. When we hear about God and we listen with an open mind and heart and we embrace what we've heard, we're drawn closer to the light. When we respond to teaching about God with stiff-necked stubbornness and cynicism, we're drawn further into the darkness. When we receive the selfless love of others and respond with gratitude and by valuing that love, we're drawn closer to the light. But when we take advantage of the love of others, when we come to expect it, when we think we deserve it, when we use it to fuel our ego and our sense of self-importance, we're drawn further into the darkness. When we choose to listen to our conscience and do what's right, even when it's difficult, even when it's inconvenient, we're drawn closer to the light. When we defy our conscience and choose to obey our own whims and desires, we're drawn further into the darkness. 
When we respond to hardship in life by rising above it and not letting it compromise our character, we're drawn closer to the light. And when we let hardship create giant grudges and long-term anger, or when we let it compromise our integrity, we're drawn further into the darkness. But the more that we respond to God's grace in our lives, rather than the, to the temptation of the darkness, we are drawn closer and closer to the threshold between the light and the darkness. When we come up to the threshold, by now we have become convinced that we want to be free from the darkness, that we want to embrace the goodness, the light of God, and that the only way we can do it is by committing ourselves to following Jesus Christ. That is when we have reached this point. And we face a decision. We can either commit ourselves to following Jesus, and pursuing the light, letting the light take over our lives so that we might be free from the darkness. Or we can stay with what we know. We can stay with where we're comfortable. We can stay with the darkness. That is the choice that we make when we reach this point. But if we do choose to cross, cross the threshold, if we do decide to commit ourselves to following Jesus, we pass from darkness into light. And when that happens, we experience something called uh, justifying grace. It's the way that God works in our lives when we make that decision to follow Jesus. And all that means is that we become claimed by Jesus as one of his own. The perfect goodness of Jesus, the perfect righteousness of Jesus is credited, credited to our account. And we become saints. We become holy ones. We become children of God. We become children of the light. Now for some people this step happens in a, a single recognizable dramatic moment. Maybe you said a special prayer at a church altar, a revival, a camp, or a retreat. For others, on the other hand, it's more subtle and gradual. It's like falling in love. You don't know exactly when you've crossed the threshold. You just know you found yourself on the other side of it. <coughs> Whether it's sudden and dramatic or gradual, eventually, when we cross that threshold, it means we have passed from darkness to light. And there's a word for that. It's called conversion. And by the way, that second possibility, the, the gradual, that was C.S. Lewis's experience. C.S. Lewis was one of the greatest Christian minds of the 20th century, and he describes his conversion experience this way. He was going for a ride in the sidecar of his brother Warney's motorcycle, and he said later that all he knows is that before the ride, he didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And after the ride, he did. Now, that might have said something about Warney's driving. I don't know. But the point is, it can be subtle and dramatic, or it can be subtle and gradual. But uh, something else happens when we cross the threshold. We receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in our hearts and begins a lifelong remodeling effort in our hearts. He, he shines the light into the darkest places of our hearts. He pursues and seeks out those places where the darkness remains. Because even after we cross the threshold, the darkness still has some hooks in us. We still, still carry some of the wounds we picked up over there. And in fact, we even become vulnerable to the darkness, throwing some new hooks in us. We become vulnerable to the temptations to be prideful, to be um, self-righteous, to be judgmental, to be intolerant. Those are new temptations that we have once we cross that threshold. But it's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to shine the light of God into our hearts and lives. And chasing away the darkness. The problem is, he doesn't go anywhere he's not welcome. God honors our 
the dignity of our free will. So he's not going to chase the darkness out of the corners of our lives if we don't let him go. But the more we let the Holy Spirit shine the light of God into even the darkest corners of our lives, the farther we go into them. Now, if you're on this side of the threshold, your eternity is secure. You're going to heaven. But in order to have the fullness of life that God wants you to have here, you've got to keep moving. You can't just stop right here inside of the threshold and hang out until heaven. You've got to keep moving. Because let me tell you something, if you're not moving this way, you're moving that way. <coughs> because it remains true that even when you're on this side of the threshold, the more you give into the darkness, the more you go this direction. And the question probably pops into your mind, once you cross the threshold, can you cross back? There are some communities of Christians who uh, don't believe that once you cross the threshold, once you've experienced conversion, they don't believe you can cross back over. And they point to this scripture from Romans that says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now it is true that none of those things can separate us from God's love, but friends, keep in mind, God's love, God's grace, is active on both sides of the threshold. God still loves the people over here. They just either haven't embraced love for Him yet, or they've abandoned love for Him. Meanwhile, there are passages all throughout the Bible that warns against the children of light returning to darkness, of falling away, of persevering to the end. Why would all those warnings be there if we couldn't cross back over the threshold? There's a passage in Matthew where Jesus teaches a little bit about this. He says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Jesus is using demon possession to illustrate what it can look like when the faithful let evil back in. They can end up worse off than they were before. And that's just one of many scriptures that warn against falling away. So yes, you can cross back over to the darkness once you've stepped into the light. But here's the thing. Just like it takes a deliberate decision to step from darkness to light, it also takes a deliberate decision to step from light back into the darkness. It's not going to happen by accident. But here's the thing. By the time you've returned to the threshold, the darkness may have so much influence over you, so many hooks in you, that you may want to step back over the threshold. That's why, once again, it's important to always be moving further and further into the light. Because if you're not moving forward, you're moving back. And by the way, we mark the crossing of the threshold with an external expression. Because conversion is an internal spiritual change. But we are physical human beings. So we need something physical and external to mark and make real to us our conversion. And that experience is called baptism. Now baptism doesn't have to be even close to your conversion in time. Let me give you an example. Cheryl Thomas, where are you Cheryl? Right there. Cheryl was probably converted years ago. She experienced that internal change, that passage from darkness into light years ago, but she was only just baptized within the last year. Her baptism still marked her conversion, but the two events were separated by years. They didn't have to happen at the same time. It was an external expression of something that had happened years ago in her heart. It can happen the other way around, too. In our tradition, we baptize infants. My own son, Charlie, was baptized the same day Cheryl was. Well, by baptizing him, 
We were putting faith in God that His convenient grace will be at work in Charlie's life, bringing him up to this point when he is old enough to decide for himself to take that step. It was also a promise that her mother, or his mother and I, and his godparents made, and his church family made, to nurture him so that when he becomes old enough to make the decision for himself, he is right here ready to go. Baptizing infants is anticipating. Cheryl's baptism looked back at her conversion, but the baptism of an infant looks forward in faith to their conversion. So baptism doesn't have to happen close to the conversion, but there are links. The conversion is the inward reality that is expressed outwardly through baptism. But this is how the battle between darkness and light plays out in the human heart. But one final thing needs to be said. One more thing needs to be said about the people over here. As I said earlier, people who are on that side of the threshold in the light can be confident that they are destined for eternal life with Jesus Christ. It's, it's certain, it's guaranteed if they're over there. But it doesn't necessarily follow that the people over here are necessarily destined for hell. Now don't get me wrong, I believe in hell. But just because they haven't crossed the threshold doesn't mean that's necessarily where they're headed. Consider, for instance, children who haven't crossed the threshold yet. Consider, for instance, people with debilitating cognitive disabilities who were born that way. Those people have not chosen to cross the threshold, so they're technically over here. The thing about it is, they lack the capacity to understand the threshold. They don't know what the stakes are. They can't make that choice, and God is just. So I can say with confidence that those people, children who are too young to understand, and people who are born with significant cognitive disabilities, are covered by God's grace and destined for heaven. On the other hand, think about this scenario. Think about a woman who grew up in Saudi Arabia, knows nothing but Islam. All she knows about Christianity is that it's the white man's religion. She doesn't know anything else. She doesn't know the threshold is there, but God's convenient grace is at work in her life. She 